The sun is widely known as the bringer of all life on Earth. It provides plants with the energy they need to support the rest of the planet, building the very basis of what allows life to flourish here. Acting as the very first step of photosynthesis, the sun is undoubtedly one of, if not the most important asset to our planet. But what happens when you take that away? There are places in this world where not a beam of sunlight ever reaches, such as deep within cave systems, and anywhere in or beneath the oceanic bathypelagic zone. Despite this, these places often have flourishing ecosystems. So then that begs the question, how do they do it? As life above the abyss goes on, debris fall from above into the ocean floor. This debris is usually made of flakes from dead plants and animals and their feces, as well as bits of sand, sill, and other inorganic dust. This debris is known as marine snow. Marine snow is a primary food source for many of the species residing in the deep. To list just a few of these animals, the vampire squid, eel larvae, and zooplankton all rely on marine snow as a primary food source. The marine snow that isn't eaten during its slow descent to the bottom gathers at the ocean floor and takes the form of a muddy ooze that blankets an estimated 75% of the ocean floor. From here, it is either decomposed or eaten by deep sea scavengers. This is just one of the many energy sources that will be discussed today, but for now, let's take a look at the caves. There are three main types of cave-dwelling organisms. These are troglobites, troglophiles, and troglozines. Troglozines are species who use caves sporadically, but spend most of their time above ground. Troglozines cannot establish subterranean populations. A few examples of troglozines would be bats, raccoons, and cave bears. Try to think of troglozines as cave guests more than real cave dwellers. Troglophiles are species that can live out their entire lives underground, but can also come up to the surface. A few examples of troglophiles would be earthworms, harvestmen, and some frogs. The last type of troglofauna, troglobites, are organisms that live exclusively in caves and never come up to the surface. A few examples of troglobites would be the white cave velvet worm, cave fish, and pseudoscorpions. Troglobites are heavily dependent on troglophiles and troglozines for food. Troglozines bring in organic material from the outside and often leave scraps behind for cave decomposers. One of the most important troglozines, bats, provide caves with guano, which many subterranean ecosystems are solely dependent on. Bat guano is eaten by many organisms, mostly including fungi and bacteria, which then go on to feed the rest of the ecosystem. If bats were to go extinct, then many other species would go extinct right along with them. Sinkholes and streams are also important for cave ecosystems as they carry organic matter from the surface into caves. This organic matter mostly consists of leaves and twigs that are used as food for bacteria and some small troglobites. There are also ways in which organisms synthesize energy without using terrestrial scraps. I'm talking about chemosynthesis. Chemosynthesis is defined by the Oxford Dictionary as the synthesis of organic compounds by bacteria or other living organisms using energy derived from reactions involving inorganic chemicals, typically in the absence of sunlight. Chemosynthesis is heavily relied on in both deep sea and cave ecosystems in several forms across many different species, usually creating oases of life in their wake. These chemosynthetic oases are some of the only places on Earth where the ultimate source of energy is not the sun, but the Earth itself. The first life on Earth is hypothesized to have gotten its energy around 3.8 billion years ago through chemosynthetic methods that are still used by many life forms today. Organisms that make use of chemosynthesis are known as chemoautotrophs. There are two main sources of chemosynthesis among marine life, those being hydrothermal vents and cold seeps. Hydrothermal vents can be described as deep sea volcanic vents that spew out geothermally heated chemical rich water out into the open ocean. This chemical soup is created when seawater seeps into the hydrothermal vent and is heated up by 2190 degree Fahrenheit hot magma. Then chemical reactions occur and metallic chemicals are transferred from the hot ocean crust and into the water. This now 660 degree Fahrenheit water then begins to flow upwards and mix with the near freezing seawater 
causing rapid chemical reactions to take place that then result in some of the chemicals condensing into the supersaturated liquid chemical solution that spews out from the chimney-like hydrothermal vents or transfers into mineral-rich deposits on the sea floor. There are two types of hydrothermal vents, black smokers and white smokers. Black smokers, the hotter of the two, emit iron sulfide, which is black. White smokers emit barium, calcium, and silicon, which are white. Hydrothermal vents can be over 150 feet tall depending on circumstances. Microorganisms, including bacteria and archaea, use the chemical energy from the vents to convert carbon into glucose. These microorganisms form the base of diverse food webs in many deep sea ecosystems. Cold seeps, on the other hand, are sites found throughout the ocean where hydrocarbon, methane, and sulfide seep through cracks in the ocean floor. There are four main types of chemosynthetic cold seeps. These are methane seeps, mud volcanoes, gas hydrate seeps, and brine pools. In methane seeps, methane and hydrogen sulfide bubble out of the sea floor where they are then used by microbes for energy. Mud volcanoes form when mud is pushed out of the ground by methane gas and it builds up over time into a mound of soft flowing mud. Mud volcanoes are the hardest cold seep for life to thrive in as most animals cannot settle on the flowing mud. Nevertheless, life persists. Gas hydrate seeps are sites where methane ice forms under low temperature, high pressure conditions. This methane ice is eaten by bacteria which are then eaten by ice worms that burrow into the frozen methane. Brine pools are large areas of seawater that seeps up through layers of salt, creating an area of water that is much denser and saltier than the water around it, forming an underwater lake as they are sometimes called. Not much lives within the brine pools because of how salty they are, but the rim of the pools are often rich with life, mostly bivalves like mussels and scallops. Many cave ecosystems have chemoautotrophic microbes that drive energy from chemical reactions that take place in caves, usually redox reactions, as well as dissolved chemicals. These microbes will often form microbial mats, which are multi-layered sheets of bacteria and archaea that can feed entire ecosystems. The mobile cave in Romania was cut off from the outside world by a limestone cast for the last five and a half million years until it was discovered in 1987. This cave has an ecosystem that is entirely based on chemosynthesis. The air in this cave is much more chemically rich and has less oxygen than the outer atmosphere, making it dangerous for humans, but fitting for the chemoautotrophs. Moving away from chemosynthesis, underwater food falls occur when carcasses or likewise fall to the deep ocean floor, providing nutrients for the life forms residing in the deep. By far the most important and impactful of these food falls are whale falls. When whale carcasses fall to the ocean floor, they can support entire ecosystems for decades. Whale falls come in four stages. In the first stage, mobile scavengers such as hagfish and sleeper sharks pick nearly all of the flesh off the bones of the whale. This process usually takes months to over a year. During the second stage, invertebrates will colonize the bones of the carcass and capitalize off of any leftover organic material in the surrounding sediments or on the bones. This stage typically lasts a few years. In the third stage, chemoautotrophic bacteria break down the lipids embedded within the bones. These bacterial mats provide nutrients for many other species such as mussels, sea snails, clams, and worms that colonize the bones during this stage. Whale bones are very rich with lipids, so this stage usually lasts anywhere from 50 to possibly 100 years. This high concentration of lipids is also what separates whale carcasses from other types of food falls. The fourth stage is known as the reef stage. After all organic compounds have been expunged from the whale, the bones can still provide a hard, stable place for suspension and filter feeders like reefs, barnacles, and sponges to take hold, meaning that even hundreds of years after the whale's death, its body may still be able to provide small oases of life within the deep. Similarly to other food falls, wood falls are pieces of wood that have sunk to the sea floor that host communities of life that use the wood for food and sometimes shelter. Several species have evolved to feed exclusively off of the wood falls, such as the wood boring bivalves. These species employ the use of bacteria to help digest the wood. These wood fall ecosystems behave similarly to terrestrial dead wood communities that house termites and tree lice, both of which also use endosymbiotic bacteria to help digest the wood. 
A major difference within marine wood-eating bacteria is that when they break down the wood, they produce sulfide, which is then used by chemoautotrophic bacteria for energy. Both whale falls and wood falls serve as ecological stepping stones for chemoautotrophs in that they allow them to disperse between different chemosynthetic habitats. Similarly to the reef stage of whale falls, wood falls can be used as places for barnacles, sponges, and the like to take hold. A keystone species is a species in which most of the other life forms in an ecosystem are heavily dependent on, so much so that if the keystone species were to be removed, the ecosystem would change drastically, or perhaps even collapse entirely. There are three types of keystone species, predators, mutualists, and engineers, though I will mostly be focusing on the latter two. Keystone predators are species that control the herbivore populations, ensuring that they don't eliminate certain plant species within the habitat or likewise. Mutualists are species that have mutualistic interactions with other species. In keystone mutualists, these interactions are integral to the ecosystem, and without them, the ecosystem cannot function as it does. A common example of keystone mutualists would be bees and flowers. The last type of keystone species are known as ecosystem engineers. These species can modify, maintain, create, and sometimes even destroy entire habitats. We previously went over bats, which are one of the most important keystone species in the world, both on the surface and in caves. In subterranean ecosystems, they can be classified as keystone engineers. Another example of a subterranean engineer would be snotites. Snotites are chemosynthetic bacteria that form microbial mats over the walls and ceilings of caves. Snotites have the consistency of mucus, so when they drip down to the cave floor or into cave water, they are eaten by other organisms within the cave, providing the base of that small food chain. Similarly to bats, whales are extremely important keystones both when they are alive and, as we discussed earlier, when they are dead. A very important example of a keystone mutualist would be tube worms. Tube worms live on the ocean floor near hydrothermal vents and live symbiotically with the bacteria that harness nutrients from the vents. Tube worms are integral to getting nutrients from the vents out into the rest of the marine ecosystem. All of these are just a few examples of keystone species. Both bats and whales are suffering from a decline in numbers due to human influence, but don't get nearly enough attention as they should. This is why people need to be more aware of the damages that overfishing and habitat destruction can do. The importance of these species simply cannot be understated. With that, I hope you all learned something about the alien worlds that live beneath us. Bye bye